Hello, and welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, and our case today comes to you from uh, the realm of orthopedic pathology. Um, it's somewhat of an unusual case uh, in my experience, and uh, perhaps we'll provide some insights into both the uh, uh, way that chemistry um, and genetics and surgical pathology can interact. So uh, the patient is a 50-year-old man who came to the emergency room uh, complaining of some fevers and a buttock mass with a draining sinus. Well, that, of course, immediately alerted people to the possibility of uh, neoplasia and so forth, or possibly an infection or something of that sort. And so uh, very quickly, a, a CT scan was ordered, uh, which uh, revealed uh, a very bulky uh, uh, area of calcification and a variable uh, uh, intensity of signal. Uh, both on the coronal and transverse sections, you can see that this appears to involve multiple compartments, posterior, uh, more medial compartments uh, in the thigh and up into the buttock, uh, as you see here. Um, and then possibly here is our draining sinus, just the very tip of the iceberg. So um, this raises a very interesting uh, consideration. Uh, is this neoplasm or something else? What sort of differential should we be thinking about when we see uh, soft tissue calcifications. Um, so uh, not being a radiologist, I went to my favorite uh, radiology site and said, hey, what do I think of when I see soft tissue calcification? And uh, fortunately, there's a very useful mnemonic, tick MTV. So I don't like MTV and uh, I don't like ticks. So uh, I guess we don't like soft tissue calcifications. But here's what that stands for, tumor. So tumoral calcinosis, synovial osteochondromatosis, or some other soft tissue tumor uh, with uh, calcification or ossification are possibilities. Uh, I, inflammation, uh, various uh, inflammatory or infectious diseases, uh, scleroderma, dermatomyositis, parasitic infections, uh, pancreatitis, calcific myonecrosis, these sorts of things can uh, lead to uh, soft tissue calcifications probably not on this scale and scope that we're seeing in our current situation, but uh, we're thinking about, and our patient was from a minority ethnic group and so might be considered at risk for some of these more exotic diseases. Congenital ne ne uh, disorders such as Euler's-Danlos -Danlos syndrome, myositis ossificans progressiva uh, also could be considered. Of course, the age group uh, for these would usually be younger than a middle-aged man. Metabolic disorders, hyperparathyroidism, primary or secondary, certainly could lead to extensive soft tissue calcification and metastatic calcification due to uh, neoplasia or other reactions uh, can be a possibility. Calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease, usually around joint spaces, not on the scale of our current case, and uh, calcium hydroxyapatite deposition. Following uh, trauma, certainly myositis specific hands or other sorts of things could uh, uh, result and ensue with uh, variable uh, areas of ossification or calcification. Again, not usually on the scope and scale that we have in our current case, although we have seen some bulky myositis specific hands. And finally, vascular calcifications usually track along vessels and are uh, readily identifiable radiographically. So looking at this list, I think we might think about metabolic disease disorders. Uh, we might think about myositis ossificans, certainly tumoral calcinosis uh, is a possibility. Um, and uh, uh, so that's probably our main differential. So uh, in opening this up, a small biopsy sample was obtained um, just to evaluate the possibility of uh, sarcoma or other disorders or to obtain a sample for uh, culture and so forth. Uh, and as you can see at low magnification, we've got a bunch of sort of uh, calcific debris, uh, variable amounts of that uh, scattered in here and some uh, sort of uh, strands of fibrous like tissue. We'll go on to higher magnification and, and see that uh, these calcifications are rather amorphous. They're not uh, specific crystalline uh, nature um, and these uh, strands of uh, fibrovascular tissue are uh, seen here. Uh, 
So not a whole lot of uh, evidence for neoplasia, not certainly sar sarcoma, not much in the way of inflammation on an acute scale to suggest uh, acute inflammatory disease. Uh, a couple of higher magnification views uh, you can see here uh, that uh, these calcifications uh, are present both at this tissue interface, uh, which seems to be producing almost a synovial, uh, pseudosynovial type surface uh, here. Uh, and on higher magnification even, uh, we can see that there are a few atypical cells uh, in the mix here, some multinucleate giant cells as well. Uh, and this uh, very uh, diffuse type of uh, deposition of calcium with clustering into um, lesions. Well, on further uh, evaluation, we discovered that the patient does have hyperphosphatemia, but his PTH level is normal. So we can rule out primary and secondary uh, hyperparathyroidism uh, given that situation. And uh, lo and behold, he says, well, some of my siblings have had this problem uh, as well. And uh, they were diagnosed with uh, hereditary hyperphosphatemia. So uh, that leads us to uh, the diagnosis of uh, tumoral calcinosis, uh, in this case, secondary to a familial condition, uh, specifically hyperphosphatemia. Uh, this diagnosis uh, is usually associated with a, the painless periarticular masses. Uh, they can be symmetric, but they may be abnormal. Uh, or uh, by, by, excuse me, unilateral as in our current case. And almost univer universally, they have a abnormality in the FGF23 uh, protein. Um, now of note, this uh, term tumoral calcinosis is, is strictly used to refer to a disease caused by hereditary metabolic dysfunction of phosphate regulation uh, that is associated with uh, periarticular calcinosis and should not be used to refer to just any uh, pattern of soft tissue calcification. Um, and as my surgical colleague said, oh, I've seen these before. You want to avoid surgery at all costs. So uh, let's uh, look a little bit further into the uh, pathophysiology of this disorder. Um, first of all, um, what are the disorders that are associated with FGF23 deficiency? Well, this is one. Um, the familial tumoral calcinosis. And this is in general an autosomal recessive disorder. So a little bit unusual that uh, more than one sibling would be affected. Uh, these patients have hyperphosphatemia, hypercalcemia, and elevated or inappropriately normal levels of 125 vitamin D3. But their um, serum PTH levels are usually normal. So uh, calcium can be variable, uh, but PTH levels usually normal. Now, there are a couple of mutations that have been identified and, and recognized, as well as a third one uh, that is uh, hypothesized on the basis of a limited number of patients. So GAL-NT3 and FGF23 genes uh, can be either uh, 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 mutated or, uh, or uh, rearranged in ways that produce an uh, essentially a functional or a quali qualitative uh, deficiency of FGF23. Uh, or uh, this gene, the Clotho gene, uh, also has been uh, found to be uh, able to produce this uh, syndrome. Uh, and this is uh, based on the fact that uh, the Clotho protein is an essential co-receptor for FGF23. So a mutation in that protein would therefore cause resistance to FGF23 and thus phenotypically look identical to FGF23 deficiency. Well, let's uh, think a little bit more about FGF23. It's been a, a while since I've reviewed that uh, process. Uh, I found this uh, diagram fairly helpful uh, as it illustrates that the uh, uh, protein has activity at the uh, bone level uh, as well as in the uh, kidneys. Um, in the bone, uh, FGF23 has a receptor, uh, activates ERK12 and produces probably a uh, um, phosphatolysis uh, reaction uh, releasing uh, phosphates. Uh, in the kidney, it's active both in the proximal and the distal convoluted tubule, tubule, where again, through receptor and cascade enzymatic reaction, uh, it will uh, either result in um, uh, increased uptake of uh, phosphate uh, 
uh, or other activity at the uh, uh, cell membrane, uh, leading to uh, secretion uh, of the uh, phosphates. So, uh, you know, I'm not the uh, biochemist here or the physiologist here, but I think this was interesting to see that that's the commonality here and that protein is active in both locations. Um, and uh, if you'd like to go further into that pathophysiology, I'm sure the literature is rich with uh, additional information on this. But you can see how, therefore, that a uh, defect or a deficiency in this protein uh, would lead to inactivation of these cascades um, and uh, potential problems with your phosphate metabolism that in turn leads to uh, problems uh, with uh, calcium uh, pyrophosphate de deposition in the tissues. So uh, what are our treatment options? Well, uh, traditionally, uh, these patients have adapted with a low phosphate diet and potentially some phosphate absorption blockers to reduce their uh, serum levels of uh, phosphate. Uh, renal phosphate excretion promoters, such as acetazolamide and probenicid, have been uh, used in some situation uh, to uh, sort of augment or decrease the uh, serum phosphate. And then various other uh, options are available uh, to uh, uh, either reduce the inflammation or mineralization uh, these are a little bit more toxic. And of course, surgery if necessary. Now, uh, interestingly, um, there is uh, on the horizon the potential of uh, a replacement hormone uh, to actually use the specific FGF23 hormone uh, in a uh, viable and functional state. In general, this should work for the uh, uh, gland uh, or the uh, FGF23 mutations, but would probably not work in the patients with a functional uh, receptor defect due to the clotho gene. So uh, in summary then, our sign out to, for this case today, tumoral calcification secondary to hereditary hyperphosphatemia. And I'm pleased to report that he's uh, beginning to respond to the appropriate medical therapy, um, uh, which is very encouraging because uh, obviously my surgeon did not want to operate further if he could avoid this. Well, we hope that you enjoyed that case and uh, that you'll subscribe to our channel so that uh, you'll catch future releases as they become available. We always welcome your comments and feedback to our content, suggestions for new ideas or ways to present uh, the material that we are coming across uh, in our day-to-day uh, -day practice. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me and I hope to see you again soon.